Arab-Israeli present-day war, does it all headed towards Ezekiel 38-39 famous prophecy? As I was praying and observing the situation in Israel the other day, which has been attacked by the Hamas army in the sudden most tragic attacks that Israel has ever experienced since the Holocaust, the words came to me from the Lord God in prayer, Ezekiel, 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 and later came to me in prayer the title of Joel Rosenberg's famous book, The Ezekiel Option, written in the style of a fiction thriller, with fictional characters, but based on one of the most amazing mystery. Prophecies of the Biblical Prophet Ezekiel, Chapters 38, 39 In this exciting book, the author through the main characters of the story, the former director of the Mossad Mordecai and assistant to the President of the United States Bennett, reveals and identifies in detail the mysterious list of countries and peoples, which in coalition with the Prince of Rosh, according to the prophecies of Ezekiel, will launch a war of aggression against tiny modern Israel. There is not the slightest doubt that Prince of Rosh is modern Russia, which has shown its true face in the current bloody and despicable war against the Ukrainian people. This is what the author of the above novel proves through a series of convincing historical quotes and facts. Further you can read and see in this video fragments from the book, showing in the form of a dialogue, who are the countries mentioned by the ancient prophet, which in the last days will go to war against Israel. In a carefully planned terrorist attack by Hamas militants against Israel, on Saturday, October 7, 2023, exactly 50 years after the last full-scale Arab war with the full military support of Prince Rosh, then the Soviet Union, seems to be a powerful impetus to the fulfillment of the ancient biblical prophecy of Ezekiel in chapters 38, 39, followed very soon, or almost immediately by the second coming of the Messiah himself, as hinted at in the last verses of chapter 39. As Israeli observers and commentators have observed in regard to the terrorist attack on Israel, this is the greatest tragedy since the Holocaust. Never since the Holocaust have so many Jews been killed in one day. To date, over 1,000 deaths have been reported, and about 150 Jewish hostages taken, including women and children. Reading what was predicted by the biblical prophet Ezekiel in chapters 38, 39 some, perhaps even many, will have a big question. How and why would such a huge country like Russia in alliance with Islamic Iran, Libya, and the other countries listed in Ezekiel 38 would go to such a large-scale war against geopolitically tiny Israel? Here are some new, perhaps little-known reasons. Iran has publicly vowed to wipe Israel off the world map, and has vowed more than once. Past Iranian President Ahmadinejad sponsored a conference called A World Without Zionism. That was the main title of this conference. The second, however, not as prominent as the first, was A World Without America. Iran is protected by its main suppliers of nuclear technology, the Russians. Moscow has invested hundreds of billions of dollars in Iran's nuclear programs. Iran's nuclear development shops and facilities have been filled with Russian scientists, advisors, technicians, Russian guards, and their families. The whole world knows what barbaric attacks Moscow carried out with the help of Iranian kamikaze drones attacks on the civilian energy and other infrastructure of the Ukrainian cities in the winter of 2023, and to this day, in order to deprive the Ukrainian population of heat water, and electricity. Iranian Shahids, rebranded by Russian militants into the floral name Geranium II, nicknamed mopeds in Ukraine because of their moped-like sound, have been attacking Ukrainian cities and towns almost constantly, as we ourselves here witness on a regular basis. We have not the slightest doubt who is the Gog from the land of Magog, about whom God speaks by the mouth of Ezekiel, but still, I urge you to listen carefully to the passages from the above-mentioned book of the Ezekiel Option after this commentary.
the prophet Ezekiel more than 2,500 years ago predicted a vast alliance that would include Russia, Persia, Iran, and many nations with you who would in the last days suddenly march against Israel to plunder and to take booty and to lay their hand on the newly inhabited ruins and on the people who had been gathered from among the nations. Ezekiel 38 verse 12 And the current attack on Israel, as I understand it through God's revelation is some kind of prelude or preparation for these monumental events. Why monumental? Because according to this prophecy, the whole world will see the manifest hand and judgment of the biblical God over the enemies of Israel, and many people will get a great chance to see whose God is the true God, and therefore be able to turn to that real God for salvation. Plus, what the Bible prophets have been predicting for centuries, Israel itself will sincerely and permanently return to her God and know that He is the Lord. The scattering of Israel to all nations and their return back to their historical homeland, which is commonly referred to as Zionism, was foretold by God Himself almost 26 centuries in advance. The return of Jews to Israel from virtually every nation observed over the last century, especially since the establishment of Israel in 1947, is a clear fulfillment of these prophecies, though not yet in their entirety. In our times more than ever, the prophecy of Ezekiel 38, 39, is more relevant than ever, and almost everything seems to be in place for its fulfillment. So where does Israel fit into all of this? The Texas-based Genso Oil Company recently publicized the discovery of a huge oil field near the Dead Sea. Israeli Infrastructure Minister Benjamin Ben Eliezer called the field just the beginning. Britain's natural gas announced the discovery of vast natural gas deposits 20 miles offshore from Tel Aviv. The initial estimate of the only tested reserves is about 3.5 cubic trillion. A group such as Oil of Zion dug eight wells for the study, each showing the presence of oil and gas. The founder of this organization, John Brown, believes that the amount of oil reserves hidden under Israel could rival the amount of oil under Saudi Arabia. A huge oil field in Israel would completely change the balance of power in the Middle East. Such an oil field could simply break the back of the OPEC oil organization, made up of Arab oil trading nations. OPEC would hardly allow Israel to be a member, no matter how much oil Israel would have. So it seems that they will be left with only one option for dealing with this issue. That option is best expressed by Joel Rosenberg. It has the same title as his novel, The Ezekiel Option. In my entire life, I have never seen the leaders of Russia, Iran and Turkey together in the same place at the same time. But here they are, Russian President Putin, Iran's secular leader President Raisi and Turkey's President Erdogan, all at a meeting of formidable allies in Tehran, Iran, the former ancient land of Persia. Putin is of nominal Orthodox descent, while Raisi and Erdogan are practicing Muslims. Putin seems to want to restore the vast Russian Empire of Peter the Great, while the two followers of Muhammad want to restore an Islamic caliphate similar to the 400-year-old Ottoman Empire. All three seek access to the warm waters of the Mediterranean Sea and are antagonistic to the modern nation of Israel for historical and religious reasons. Given Putin's unprovoked attack on sovereign Ukraine and his apparent aspirations to reclaim the Russian homeland, it is not surprising that a Russian political party is reportedly pushing for an upgrade in titles for Putin. They propose replacing the word president with the archaic, authoritarian term sovereign. Understandably, Bible students and teachers view this recent meeting of leaders as a prophetic foreshadowing of the end-time war described to us in Ezekiel 38 and 39. Just as robins and tulips are harbingers of spring, to see these three particular countries come together as rogue allies is both disturbing and hopeful. We will move on to consider who these nations are, 
But first note that all of these people groups have a historical hatred for God's people, the Jews. The actual time of battle is reserved for the time when Israel will be restored as a repopulated ruin and will live in safety as an unfenced land. Ezekiel 38 verses 10 to 12. Israel today is the modern miracle of national restoration and the context and setting of our story. In Ezekiel 38 verse 16, God tells Gog, Thou shalt come up against my people, against Israel, like a cloud to cover the earth, it shall be in the last days, and I will bring thee into my land, that the nations may know me, when I over thee, Gog, shall display my holiness before their eyes. This righteous purpose of the nations knowing that I am the Lord is repeated many times in two prophetic chapters, 38 and 39. Eventually, God's sovereign fury, jealousy, and wrath will manifest itself in the judgment of Gog with a great earthquake, pestilence and bloodshed, and all-consuming rain and stone hail, fire and brimstone, see chapter 38 17-23. Gog's allied armies will descend upon the open fields and mountains of Israel, and every kind of ravenous bird and beast of the field will be allowed to devour them. The dead bodies and bones of Gog and his allies will be sought out for seven months and gathered in a mass grave in a large valley east of the dead, sea to cleanse the land. Israel will also collect and burn weapons and means of warfare for seven years. See 39 9-11 Thus, God will exalt himself in the eyes of all nations and sanctify, set apart himself in the eyes and hearts of his chosen people. An interesting prophetic dialogue interview between the leader of the House Church Without Walls International and the host of the TV show It's Supernatural, Sid Roth, that took place in 2012, is very relevant here. The interview confirms what has been said above. John Fenn, Sid, interestingly enough, and I haven't talked about this much outside of our home churches, but a few years ago the Lord said to me, Russia is training terrorist units and funding a lot of things like this because it has its eye on oil in the Middle East. And the Lord also told me, watch Putin. He told me this a few years ago, watch Putin, Putin is not finished yet, he's still going to be in charge of Russia again. And then watch what will happen, watch. Sid Rod, the Lord has also given you an indication, a sign when all of this is going to happen, in regards to the union of Russia and one other country. John, one of the things he said was, watch Turkey. Ezekiel 38 has Turkey called Fagarma. And there's a prediction there about an alliance with Turkey. But I didn't know at the time and I was told that it turns out that Turkey was trying to become a member of the European Union and France and another country was terribly opposed to Turkey becoming part of the European Union. And the Lord said to me, watch Europe reject Turkey and almost cast it into the hands of Russia. Sid Rod, but when Turkey becomes allied with Russia, what will happen? John Fenn, they're going to try to conquer Israel. Now please listen to the above-mentioned passages from the Ezekiel option. As I said before, in this novel, Mordecai is the former director of the Mossad, and Bennett is an aide counselor to the President of the United States. Mordecai reached into a briefcase and removed a notebook. Here, he said, handing it to Bennett. Bennett took it. Then, at Mordecai's request, he made a list of the bizarre-sounding names in the chapter's first six verses. Gog Magog Rosh Meshek Tubal Persia Kush Put Gomer Beth to Garma. Bennett stared at the list for a few moments. Were these names of people? Cities? Countries? Were they a code of some sort? They clearly described forces that would one day come like a storm against Israel to wipe her off the face of the planet. But he hadn't a clue how one could break a code 2,500 years old. Let me see if I can make some sense of all that, Mordecai offered. 
The first thing we need to understand is that the first word on the list, Gog, is not a name. It is a title, like Tsar or Pharaoh. In this case, Ezekiel tells us that Gog is a prince who will arise in a land called Magog. Which begs the question, where is Magog? One clue comes from Voltaire. The French philosopher, hero of secular humanists, Bennett asked. Exactment, said Mordecai with a smile. Voltaire was hardly a religious man. Indeed, he was a self-declared enemy of Christ. But for some reason Voltaire was intrigued with solving the riddle of Gog and Magog. Here, Voltaire had written, there is a genealogical tree of the events of this world. It is incontestable that the inhabitants of Gaul and Spain are descended from Gomer, and the Russians from Magog, his younger brother. Bennett looked up. Voltaire thought Magog was Russia, he asked in disbelief. He did, and remember, he was writing nearly 150 years before the rise of Russia as a major world power. Even more interesting, the genealogical tree to which he refers actually finds its origin in the very Bible for which he had such little regard. What do you mean? The first place the world ever heard of Magog was in the Bible. Genesis 10, Magog was a son of Japheth, who was a son of Noah. Three of his brothers were Meshech, Tubal, and Gomer. I will get to them shortly, but let us stay with Magog for the moment. The Bible lays out Noah's entire family tree. It shows how Noah's descendants migrated to Africa, Europe, and Asia, establishing the first civilizations on those continents. In trying to decode the Gog and Magog prophecy, Voltaire studied Noah's genealogical tree, then compared it with the histories of these different continents in hopes of determining where each of Noah's descendants ended up. Wait a moment. I have something else for you to read. Here it is. Ever hear of Josephus? The Roman historian? Yes. Here, Mordecai said, handing Bennett the large book. This is a compilation of the Antiquities of the Jews, a twenty-volume classic written in the first century after Christ. Look in Book 1, Chapter 6. Bennett began reading and found the reference to Magog almost immediately. He read aloud, Magog founded those that from him were named Magogites, but who are by the Greeks called Scythians. Okay, Mordecai said. Now the Scythians, we know from history, were absolute barbarians, expert horsemen but fierce, bloodthirsty killers. They actually used skulls as mugs to drink the blood of their victims. And genetically, they were Aryans. Surprised, Bennett looked up from his notes. The same Aryans that Hitler called the superior race? From the same gene pool, yes, but the Scythians did not live in Germany. Where did they live? Russia and Islamic Central Asia. You're kidding. I am not, said Mordecai. Ever been to the Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg? Can't say I have. Next time you go, check out the exhibit of Scythian artifacts found in southern Russia. And next time you are in Moscow, take the tour of the State Historical Museum on Red Square. I was just there last year, and I found case after case of Scythian artifacts all dug up by Russian archaeologists, and all on display in Russia's official museum. Bennett knew he wasn't likely to be back in Moscow any time soon. But Mordecai now had his full attention. He glanced back at chapter 38 and asked, All right, Ezekiel says this god character is the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. What does that mean? The word Rosh in Hebrew can mean head or chief, leading some scholars to the conclusion that Gog is the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal, not the prince of Rosh, Meshech, and Tubal. 
but both the Masoretic text and the Septuagint translate Rosh as the proper name of a geological place. Hold on a minute, Bennett said. What's the Septuagint and the Masa something? The Septuagint, Mordecai explained, is the oldest Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures. It was translated in Alexandria, Egypt, a few hundred years before Christ. The Masoretic text, or Masora, is the full Hebrew text of the Tanakh or Old Testament, upon which most Jewish Bibles are based. Ironically, one of the oldest and best preserved copies we have of the Masoretic text, the one giving us a complete version of Ezekiel's vision of Gog and Magog, is called the Leningrad Codex. It is housed in the Russian National Library in St. Petersburg, Russia. Why do you say that's ironic? Bennett asked. Because if you scour ancient history and languages, Mordecai said, you will find the name Rosh is linguistically related to the words Rose, Ross, and Rose, all of which were ancient names for Russia. That is ironic, Bennett said, his curiosity growing. Take Wilhelm Jesenius, for example, Mordecai continued. Jesenius was a 19th century German professor who died in 1842, but to this day he is considered the father of modern Hebrew lexicography. In his seminal work, Jesenius' Hebrew Chaldee Lexicon to the Old Testament, he concluded that the Rosh to which Ezekiel refers is undoubtedly the Russians, who are mentioned by the Byzantine writers of the 10th century, under the name the Rose, dwelling to the north of the Taurus. Incredible, said Bennett, trying to take it all in. Then what about Meshach? Mordecai didn't miss a beat. Bible scholars say Meshach is Moscow, he replied. Jesenius, for one, wrote that Meshach was founder of the Moschi, a barbarous people, inhabiting the Moschian mountains. He went on to conclude that the Greek name Moschi was, in fact, the city of Moscow. And Tubal? Ever hear of a Russian city called Tobolsk? In Siberia, right, said Bennett. The heart of Russian oil country, that is right, said Mordecai. And do you know what river it is on? No idea. Tobolsk is actually a port city at the confluence of the Irtish and Tobol rivers. Tubal, said Bennett in disbelief. Correct. Mordecai confirmed. But wait a minute, Bennett said suddenly. Aren't you actually from Tobolsk? You have a good memory, young man. I was born there, yes. Fortunately, my family got out when they did. For a long time, Tobolsk was the capital of Siberia, but eventually it became a place of horror. Tsar Nicholas II and his family were exiled there during the Russian Revolution, just before they were murdered. And Stalin built a gulag there in the 1930s, where he butchered some 50,000 political prisoners. My grandfather was among them. I had no idea, said Bennett, stunned. It is not something I talk about. You have to understand, Jonathan. The satanic brand of communism practiced by Moscow was not just another ism. Reagan was right. The Soviet Union was an evil empire. The Soviets were responsible for the deaths of a hundred million souls during the 20th century, 20 million within their own borders. It is no wonder the Soviet flag was red. The whole history of the Kremlin is soaked in blood. For seventy years, the rulers of Russia waged war against God, against Christians, against the Jews, and, by proxy at least, through the Arab League, against Israel. But they lost. The Soviet Union collapsed, and Israel survived and flourished, just as the Bible predicted. More than a million Jews fled Russia for Israel during the 1990s, just as the Bible predicted. The gates of hell did not prevail against the church in Russia. Indeed, the church there is growing again, just as the Bible predicted. 
and now the Russian government is on the verge of a terrible judgment. The one who curses you I will curse the Lord said to the Jewish people. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. A day of reckoning is coming, Jonathan. God will not be mocked. A country reaps what she sows, and the judgment of Russia is at hand. I don't know, said Bennett. What do you mean? asked Mordecai. You're really saying that five hundred years before Christ, this guy Ezekiel predicted the rise of Russia, Moscow, and Siberia when none of those places were known to him or had any historic importance at the time? That is what I am saying. But how can you be so sure all this stuff really refers to Russia? What if Ezekiel was writing about South America or Asia? I mean, how do we really know that over the centuries the name Meshach didn't evolve into Moschi and then into Muskogi or something? Mordecai smiled. You think Oklahoma plans to invade Israel? I don't know, I'm just saying, how can you? No, no, it is a fair question, Mordecai conceded. Turn over to Ezekiel 39, and read verses 1 and 2. Bennett flipped the page and began reading. And you, son of man, prophesy against Gog and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, Prince of Rosh, Meshach and Tubal, and I will turn you around, drive you on, take you up from the remotest parts of the north, and bring you against the mountains of Israel. From that passage, where are Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal located, asked Mordecai. The remotest parts of the north. In relation to what? To Israel? Exactly, said Mordecai. He turned to one of the Jackson Pollock paintings hanging on the far wall, picked up a small remote off the coffee table, pointed it at the wall, and pushed a button. A huge map of the world lowered from the ceiling, completely covering the painting. Mordecai pushed another button, and the map was lit by small spotlights hidden in the ceiling. Impressive, said Bennett. Mordecai just smiled. So, what country is located to the remotest parts of the north of Israel? It was unmistakable, even from where Bennett sat. Russia. And what city is located due north of Jerusalem? That, too, was unmistakable. Moscow. Who is left on our list? Mordecai asked. Bennett flipped back through his notepad and read off the remaining names. Persia, Kush, Put, Gomer, and Bethdagarma. Of course, said Mordecai. These are Gog's allies. Historically, Persia is the easiest to identify. Until 1935. Persia was the name of the country we now call Iran, one of the founding members of the Axis of Evil and the epicenter of modern terrorism. The Kushites, according to Josephus, settled in Africa, south of Egypt. Josephus called that area Ethiopia, but it included what we now call Eritrea and Sudan as well. Sudan, of course, has become a base camp for radical Islamic terrorism, armed for years by the Soviets and more recently by Iran. And, as you know, the Sudanese jihadists have waged a campaign of genocide, particularly in the Darfur region, killing some 300,000 people in recent years. Mordecai used a laser pointer to direct Bennett around the map on the far wall. Which brings us to Put. Josephus wrote that Fud also was the founder of Libya. Now, I know that Libya claims to have given up their weapons of mass destruction and support for terrorism. But personally, I do not believe it. And you should know that ancient Libya actually included Tunisia and Algeria, both of which have long histories of hatred toward Israel and close ties to Moscow and Tehran. What is more, notice the reference Ezekiel makes in 38:13 to Sheba and Dedan. Those are ancient names for Saudi Arabia and the Persian Gulf region. 
So what are you saying, exactly? asked Bennett. I am saying that when you add up Ezekiel's references to Central Asia, Iran, Saudi Arabia, the Persian Gulf, and North Africa, you get a coalition of modern radical Islamic countries working closely with Russia. One by one, the pieces of the puzzle were coming together. There were only two holes remaining now, Gomer and Beftagarma. These are a little trickier, Mordecai admitted. Let me start with Beftagarma, which means the house of Tagarma. The best evidence I have read for the identity of Beftagarma is in a book called Things to Come by Dr. Dwight Pentecost, a professor of Bible exposition at Dallas Theological Seminary. He concluded that Tagarma is generally identified as Turkey or Armenia. What was the evidence? Bennett asked. Louis Bauman, one of the founders of Grace Theological Seminary. Bauman wrote a book in 1942 called Russian Events in the Light of Bible Prophecy. Based on his research, Bauman also concluded that Tagarma is the Turkmen tribes of Central Asia, together with Siberia, the Turks, and the Armenians. Bennett wasn't sure he bought any of that. The Turks, from the Ottoman Empire onward, had maintained a fairly benign relationship with the Jews over the centuries. And of all the countries in the modern Muslim world, Turkey was without question the most moderate. Thousands of Israeli tourists flooded Turkish resort towns each year. To Bennett, who had dined with Turkish president in Ankara a few months earlier, it was almost inconceivable that Turkey could join a Russian Islamic invasion of Israel. But it was a question he would have to explore later. And what do you think is going to happen to them? Bennett asked. Take a look for yourself, Mordecai said, pointing him to Ezekiel 38 verses 18 to 23. Bennett found the text and began reading aloud. It will come about on that day, when God comes against the land of Israel, declares the Lord God, that my fury will mount up in my anger. And in my zeal and in my blazing wrath I declare that on that day there will surely be a great earthquake in the land of Israel. The fish of the sea, the birds of the heavens, the beasts of the field, all the creeping things that creep on the earth, and all the men who are on the face of the earth will shake at my presence, the mountains also will be thrown down, the steep pathways will collapse, and every wall will fall to the ground. I will call for a sword against him on all my mountains, declares the Lord God. Every man's sword will be against his brother. And with pestilence and blood I will enter into judgment with him, and I will rain on him and on his troops, and on the many peoples who are with him, a torrential rain, with hailstones, fire, and brimstone. I will magnify myself, sanctify myself, and make myself known in the sight of many nations, and they will know that I am the Lord. When he was done, Bennett sat silently, reading the passage again to himself. Certain phrases seemed to leap off the page at him. My blazing wrath. A great earthquake. Pestilence and blood. A torrential rain of fire and brimstone. At Mordecai's direction, Bennett then read 39:12, where Ezekiel predicted it would take seven months for Israel to bury all the bodies. Reading further, he found Ezekiel's prophecy that vultures and carnivores would swarm the region to feast themselves on the corpses of the slain. You will eat fat until you are glutted, and drink blood until you are drunk, from my sacrifice which I have sacrificed for you. The Lord God said through his prophet to the birds of the air and the beasts of the fields, You will be glutted at my table with horses and charioteers, with mighty men and all the men of war. And all the nations will see my judgment which I have executed. And the house of Israel will know that I am the Lord their God from that day onward. Was it real? Was it coming? The magnitude of it all was almost too much for Bennett to process. 
had a 2,500-year-old prophecy actually warn that a modern master Aryan race, led by Russians, Iranians, would one day try to destroy the state of Israel? If so, was the rest of the prophecy true? Was fire going to fall from heaven to consume the enemies of God? How was he supposed to take any of this seriously? He was a senior advisor to the President of the United States. He was paid to develop political strategy in the real world, not shadowbox with dead saints and ancient riddles. Yet Bennett had to admit the parallels between what Mordecai was describing from Ezekiel and what was happening in Russia and the Middle East currently were eerie, to say the least. And there was something else. Something deep inside Bennett wanted to believe there was justice in the universe, that the atrocities committed by the communists and the Nazis and the horrors committed by followers of radical Islam would be avenged in his lifetime. Was the world really about to witness the end of radical Islam as we know it? Thank you for watching. Please subscribe to the channel, like, and see you next time.